Hey, one thing I'll tell you is what we're about to talk about with the uh, how to get started with your uh, system evaluation is one important rule that we often overlook is airflow is, is the most important thing, right? The first thing you should verify is airflow. So if the airflow is not right, don't expect your pressures and temperatures to be right. It, it affects everything. So with that being said, let's look at how I would get started evaluating a system. This is what runs in my mind as to what my refrigerant temperatures and pressures should be. Uh, a lot of books that you read, they're going to tell you that superheat's going to be between, you know, 8 and 12 degrees or 8 and 15 degrees. And subcooling is going to be 8 to 12 degrees as well. So one thing that I try to tell people I come across, uh, students, uh, co-workers or whatever, if, if, if we get into this topic is the one time that that example in the book is right is in that perfect example in the book. When you see a customer, you're probably not going to see a perfect example, which is why you're there. So what should the numbers be when you hook up your gauges? That's what we're going to explore a little bit here. Okay. So when I get into a uh, service van or whatnot, I'm trying to The typical example is a 95 degree outdoor temperature or an ambient temperature, they'll say. Um, that's pretty standard stuff. That's where a lot, uh, you know, where your equipment is rated. And you'll also hear of you'll also hear of a 75 degree indoor temperature. We start out with a baseline of what your indoor temperature at a, uh, a house is going to be and what your outdoor temperature at the house uh, for that day is. Um, you know, the, 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 the perfect example is going to be a 75, maybe even an 80 degree indoor temperature, a return air temperature, and a 95 degree outdoor temperature. These are just simple numbers that you see a lot, okay? So what do we do with these? I'm going to take and look at the outdoor temperature first, give you some numbers, and this is how I break it down. Uh, one thing I tell students is you have to estimate, um, not guesstimate, but estimate, uh, create a, uh, a logical conclusion as to what you expect your refrigerant system to be working at. And then the second part to that, once you get that baseline to what is good for that day, the next step is to use your tools, use your instruments uh, to, to verify what the system actually is. So this is done with no tools or anything. This is just thinking. So 95 outside, 75 inside, all right? So with this 95 degree outdoor temperature, what do we do with that? I then try to look at the model number. The model number of a unit uh, typically leads you in the direction of the sear rating, okay? So I like to take whatever, whatever the outdoor temp is, and I'm going to add I'm going to add another number to it. And that, that other number is dictated by the sear rating of the unit that I'm working on, okay? A lot of people out in the field know that one way that we get better sear ratings is to make a physically larger unit that cuts down on the head pressure, uh, you know, it affects the compressor and everything. So we're going to add something to that 95 degrees and I call it a sear factor. Uh, it's not a play on anything. Um, that's just what happens to me, right? Or, or happens to be for me. So. I break it down by units up to 12 sear, and I like to give myself a range. If I have a 12 sear unit, um, what I'll do is I will add between 25 to 30 degrees to my outdoor condition. So if it's 95 degrees and I have a 12 sear unit or a 10 sear unit, um, I'm going to add 25 to 30 degrees above that ambient. So in, in our case, uh, like I said, I like to work with a range. That way I'm not necessarily nailed down looking for one number. But I'll add, if I add 25 to this, then 
my saturation temperature should be somewhere between 120 to 125 degrees. That's the saturation point on my condenser. All right. So if it's a 12 sear or, or up to a 12 sear. And that's going to change as we get in, right? As I get into other sear ratings, uh, let's say I have a, a 13 or a 14 sear. Those are a little bit larger coils typically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 20 to 25 degrees. So I'll have a condenser coil saturation point of somewhere between 115 right, to 120 degrees. And that's the saturation point I'm looking for. Uh, depending on the refrigerant, then, you know, you can get your pressure off of that. Uh, if I'm looking at, if I'm looking at a 15 or 16 sear, then we're going to add less than that. Okay, I'm going to add somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees above the outdoor temperature. And if it's above a 16 sear, um, you know that's a, a fairly a fairly large unit, then I'm going to add uh, 10 to 15 degrees above that. So the higher the sear rating that I go, the less above ambient I need uh, that condenser to be working at uh, to dissipate the same amount of heat or to reject the, the amount of heat uh, through that coil. All right. So and like I said, I tend to work I tend to work in a range. All right, so if we run through a couple examples of this, right? Uh, if I told you that you had a 95 degree outdoor temperature and I told you that you had a 10 sear unit, then what we're gonna do, like I said, the, 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 simple, the simple formula is gonna be your outdoor temperature plus, plus a sear factor, right? And you can come up with your own numbers, right? This is just a guideline. This is not meant to be perfect. It's meant to get you in the ballpark so you have an idea, uh, you know, when you start troubleshooting and, and doing that, okay? So the outdoor temperature plus whatever sear factor, uh, I've got those. I'll try to, it'll probably be easier to throw this up on a screen depending on the glare off of the, uh, the board and things. But uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say you have a 95 degree outdoor temperature, right? And you have a, a 10 sear unit, right? So what would be a good condenser saturation temperature to be looking at? Well, it's too easy. If we apply this 95 degrees and we add based on that 10 sear, we're gonna add somewhere between 25 and 30 degrees, right? So what you wind up with is a a condenser saturation temperature of somewhere between 120 degrees to 125 degrees. Now, if you have an R22 system, well, hey, then you can look up 122 or, uh, excuse me, uh, 120 degrees on your uh, pressure temperature chart. Uh, looks like somewhere between um, 200, so. So if this is R22, you'll have somewhere between 260 PSI and 278 PSI. And that would be the appropriate, you know, uh, saturation point and, and pressure to go with it. I try to work mainly in temperatures first. I can flip this around. If this was an R410 unit, then you're not going to have a 260 PSI. Uh, at 120 degree saturation point, right? You're gonna have somewhere around 415 or so PSI. Um, so you can, you can adjust the pressures depending on your refrigerant, but that's what I would do, okay? So uh, if we ran through another one, right, just to show you how this works, right? Condenser saturation temperature. If you ran through one and you did, um, I don't know, let's say 105 degrees outside, right? And you still had a 10 sear, maybe even a 12 sear unit, I'm still gonna add that 25 to 30 degrees uh, to that. So 
much higher day, much higher condenser pressures and temperatures, right? So, so you might be somewhere between a 130 saturation uh, temperature uh, to 135. And I can, like I said, if this was R22, 130, P, uh, 130 uh, degree saturation point is going to be somewhere around 297 PSI. Uh, 135 is going to be, you know, about about 315. So whatever your outdoor temperature is, you're going to add a factor based off of the sear rating for that unit. It's not a, a stuck number all the time, okay? And, and of course, this is perfect numbers on a perfectly clean coil, you know, fan motors working good, there, there's no problems. Uh, we can factor in other problems later and, 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 and the numbers will change, okay? Don't get stuck on one solid number because we deal with heat and heat moves all the time, okay? You can think back to the basics on uh, conduction, convection, radiation, and, and your sensible and latent heat and all that stuff that's the basic science and the basic thought processes to get, to get going. But don't get stuck on one number. Learn to, to, to read that system. Learn to estimate what you should have, okay? So hopefully that clarifies a little bit. What about the indoor return temperature? A lot of guys just look at the thermostat and uh, they'll see what, the, what the, the digital readout on that thermostat is. I like to measure the temperature in the return. It gives me a chance to look at the filters as well. But uh, let's say you got good filters and, and everything's good. You got a, a house with a 75 degree return. Um, what do we do with that number? We actually use this 75 degree uh, number, or, or I do, I use it to, uh, to do a couple things, okay? So unlike the outdoor unit where we get the sear rating and, and then we kind of uh, adjust to, uh, to get the condenser saturation point, on the number that you get for your return air temperature, we're gonna use that one to kind of get an idea of how cold the air is uh, gonna be coming out of the evaporator. So we'll get a delta T and that's just the air temperature. And we also are gonna use it to get an idea of our evaporator saturation point, okay? Uh, our saturation temperature. So if I have, uh, we'll, we'll take the refrigerant side first, off of this return, okay? Whatever my return air is, right? So I'm gonna subtract, and like I said, this is just me. I like to work in ranges, I don't not to pin myself down. I'm gonna subtract between 30 and 35 degrees. So whatever our return air temperature is, minus 30 to 35 degrees will give us an idea of what our evaporator saturation temperature is gonna be running at, okay? Or, or what point we're, we, we're gonna kinda shoot for, okay? So in this case, uh, let me grab my blue marker again. If I were to take a 75 degree return temperature, right? Everybody, everybody wants a 40 degree coil, but but this is how this is how you got to that number, and I think people forget it. All right. So 75 degrees, and me personally, if, if I if I subtract 30 to 35 degrees from that then what you're gonna wind up with is a coil temperature, right? You're gonna wind up between a 40 and a 45 degree between a 40 and 45 degree uh, evaporator saturation temperature, okay? So that's, that's, that's where they got it from, okay? That's, that's how the 40 came to be. Like I said, I, I personally like to work in a range uh, if this is, it's easy for me to take this range and, and say that a 40 degree saturation point for R22 is right at 69 or 70 PSI uh, as you're looking at an analog set of gauges, all the way up to uh, 76 PSI uh, at a 45 degree mark, okay? If this was 410, I can take this same layout and flip refrigerants at a different house call, you know, an hour later or whatnot in my day, 
and I can take that 40 or 45 degree uh, saturation temperature and come up with 119, 120 PSI on my low side, um, up to about, uh, about 130 PSI, okay? So that's the way we would work it. What happens if, if grandma's compressor has been broke for a week uh, you know, COVID happens, so parts are, are, are hard to come by sometimes. So, so what if the whole house got heated up and, and we're looking at something like a, uh, an 85 degree? What if you got an 85 degree return, right? Same principle, right? I'm going to subtract 30 to 35 degrees away from that return air temperature that I measure and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind up getting a better estimate of what my refrigerant temperature is going to be in that evaporator. So we're going to be somewhere between a, uh, a 45, right? 85 and 30, that's 50. Well, actually, uh, yeah, somewhere between a 50 and a 55 degree evaporator saturation temperature, right? Not everything is a 40 degree coil. It depends on how hot the air coming into that, uh, into that coil is gonna be. This is gonna affect it greatly, okay? So keep that in mind. So that's how I would use the return air temperature and, and this little range, right? That little range to, to estimate what my perfect saturation temperature would be. The second way that we're going to do this is uh, we can use we can use that 75 degree return, right? The the typical the typical delta T on your evaporator coil is going to be somewhere um, around you know the 18 to 20 degree mark. All right. So what does that mean? We have a change in temperature of approximately 20 degrees. Now, perfect humidity, perfect air, like everything's perfect, right? It, it's the textbook perfect example. So if I have 75 degrees, if I were to subtract somewhere around the 20 degree delta T that we mentioned, then you would expect to see somewhere between, uh, you know, or somewhere about a 55 degree supply air temperature, okay? I like to work in ranges, so if it's 18 to 20, then you may have somewhere between a, a 55 to a 57 degree supply air temperature. Okay, That's how we use the return air temperature on the, the air aspect of it, right? We use it for uh, getting a, a base point for our saturation temperature on our refrigerant and also air temperature, okay? Now that principle is gonna apply, guess what? Even if the house is 85 degrees, right? So we would take away that 18 to 20 degrees, okay? And we would be looking at somewhere between a 65 and a 67 uh, degree supply air temperature. Right? And, and we can move numbers uh, and go all over the place. In some cases, you know, depending on humidity, you may get 16 to 20 degrees. That's the way I think that gives me a nice range to work in. And once I, uh, like I said, all this is done before you ever touch the system with a set of gauges. So knowing a couple air temperatures will get your mind rolling in the right direction and you, you think you know what it should be. Then we're going to actually use tools and get the realistic readings um, on that system. All right, so that's how we're going to use this. Hope it makes sense.